Um, with that said, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to our passage today in Psalms chapter 133. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, uh, you can find one in the pew in, the front of, in front of you. And please feel free to take that home with you if you'd like. So Psalms chapter 133, a whole whopping three verses that we'll be reading this morning. It says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now, for those of you who know me well, I'm not usually a very confrontational individual. And I was joking with the guys on Tuesday morning when we were having breakfast. I says, I don't know exactly what I was thinking when I chose this passage. Um, like of all people, let it be the guy that, that doesn't really like conflict. But here I am, so let's dive in together. Now in the heading of our passage this morning, we'll find once again that it is King David who penned this passage of Scripture. Now, the timing and historical context is left somewhat um, up to question, but really doesn't affect the meaning of the text itself. So we're not really going to spend much time there today. Verse 1 begins off with the word behold. In other words, pay attention. It alerts us as the readers or listeners to the fact that something important is about to be said. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Now herein we find the main focus of the entire psalm and our message this morning. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Now while this could be applied to a physical brotherhood, I believe that it also has a much deeper application which comes in the form of our spiritual brotherhood as children of God. Galatians 3, 26 to 28 says, For in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on, to Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This passage states that all who are in Christ are one. There is no distinction between genders, nationalities, denominations, or social status for those who have placed their faith and trust in Christ. Paul again addresses this very topic in his first letter to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 20 says, For just as the body is one and has many members... And all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all are made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would, the sense, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member... Where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So with that in mind, how good and pleasant it is when all the parts of the body dwell in unity. Now it's interesting that King David used two different words to describe the effect or the result of brothers dwelling in unity. First off, it is good. 
That is to say, by definition, that it is something which is to be desired or approved of, or which possesses or displays moral value. So to rephrase it a bit, David starts by saying that unity between brothers is to be desired. So there's number one. Unity is a good thing. But not only is it good, it's also a pleasant thing. This would imply that it's also enjoyable or satisfying. See, many things are good, but not all, things, not all good things are pleasant. And likewise, while many things are pleasant, not all pleasant things are good. But when it comes to brothers dwelling in unity... David suggests in our passage this morning that both, bo- or sorry, that both are true. As we carry on in verse 2, David begins to give examples which the original audience or readers would have understood very well. Verse 2 says, It, that is brother, brotherly unity, is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down the collar of his robes. Now here we see a reference to the anointing with precious oil and specifically to the anointing of Aaron as a high priest. Now if we read the account of the anointing of Aaron in Leviticus 8, you'll find that not only was the oil poured on his head, but also on his garments to sanctify him completely. Now in the same way, Unity within the body of Christ doesn't just apply to one or two parts of the body, but rather it should be all-encompassing. That is to say, it's, it's not just about a couple people within an individual church, or a couple churches within a city being united, but rather the Christian church as a whole. Now, that's not to say that you can't start small, But the end goal should be far greater than we alone are capable of accomplishing. See, the stark reality is that we in our own strength will never be able to bring about unity within the church. Because in and of ourselves, we have nothing that can bring about true, authentic unity apart from Christ. Now, it's important that we also understand why this abundant use of anointing oil was significant. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it signified the consecrating or sanctifying of Aaron to perform his duties as the high priest. And the same could be said about the application here today. See, for all those who have placed our faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross, or as, sorry, Christ on the cross, we as one body are sanctified or made holy by the blood of Christ. Picking up again in verse 3, we read, It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Now, living in the north like we do, the dew is something that we're quite familiar with. As the nights get cooler, the fall temperatures arrive, That cool air meets the somewhat warm ground, heated by the sun during the day. And the dropping air temperature produces condensation at that meeting point. And that is what forms the dew that we know so well. But the dew of Hermon is a bit different than we would be used to. And it's explained here. The dew of Hermon and the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, to which the psalmist referred, differs entirely from the ordinary dew of our country and is a phenomenon peculiar to Palestine and the east. It is a soft mist that comes from the Mediterranean during the summer when the heat is greatest and the country is burnt up with the terrible sunshine. It is attracted by the inland heights and condensed in copious moisture upon their sides, and creeps down upon the plains, reviving and refreshing every green thing. It comes first of all to Mount Hermon, and helps to keep up its unchanging robe of snow, and to fill its springs and feed its cedars. And then it flows down, and makes the corn to grow green in the valleys, 
and the vines to swell out their purple grapes in the vineyards, and the lilies to unfold their crimson radiance in the fields. And it is to this wonderful phenomenon that the psalmist compares the unity and harmony of those who dwell together as brethren. That was a quote from H. Macmillan, D.D. A mist that brings life and growth from the highest peaks to the lowest valleys. David here in verse 3 likens the result of brothers dwelling in unity to this dew which falls on the mountains of Zion. It would seem to suggest that brothers and sisters dwelling together in unity should bring life and growth within the body of Christ. Our psalm this morning ends by saying, For there the Lord commands the blessing, life forevermore. Or depending on which translation you're reading, it may say something like, The Lord has pronounced his blessing, life forevermore. Here in these three short, simple verses, David outlines five truths about brothers dwelling in unity. First off, it's a good or virtuous thing. Secondly, it is pleasant or enjoyable. Thirdly, it is something that applies to all who have been sanctified by the blood of Christ. Next, it should bring life and growth within the church. And now finally, it is blessed by God. Now, it really doesn't take much to realize that the church is having and has had a hard time with this whole unity topic. As with many things in life, we as sinful human beings struggle with this little thing called pride. Often overlooked or ignored, our desire to be right often acts as the greatest wedge within any relationship. And when it pertains to the matters of the Christian faith, it's no different. For centuries... Sorry, I just lost my spot totally. For centuries, personal opinions and convictions have divided the church and in many instances created tremendous amounts of hurt. Take, for example, the argument of post-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or pre-tribulation, rapture. On one hand, you have those who believe that, well, this rapture is going to take place before the seven years of tribulation that we read about. Then, with just as strong of convictions, you have others who would say that there's no way that that could be right. Instead, believers will go through the first three and a half years of the tribulation, but then be raptured before the final three and a half years. But if two opinions are good, then three must be better. (laughs) And so then there are those who would say that, well, believers are going to go through the full seven years of the rapture, and then will be taken up. Or sorry, seven years of the tribulation, and then be taken up. And then there are those who believe that, well, there's not actually going to be any physical rapture at all. Now, while that might not seem like it should really be a big deal, this debate has been a huge source of contention within the church. And when I say the church here, I'm not referring to a church, but the global church of Christ. Congregations have divided, relationships have been destroyed, all to be right about an issue of personal conviction on a topic that we really aren't given all the specifics to. And amidst all the fighting, the real truth has been thrown out and forgotten. And that is the simple fact that Jesus is coming back for his children. See, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter who was right or who was wrong about the when. Now, that's just one example, but we could go on. Baptism timings. When are you supposed to be baptized after you accept Christ? Or how are you supposed to be baptized? Spiritual gifts. Music styles. Pew construction. Women in ministry. See, each topic has multiple stances 
that have been taken. And yet none are salvation issues, even as much as we sometimes make them out to be. See, much like the whole pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib arguments, at the end of the day when we stand before the throne of God, whether our opinion was right or not, really isn't going to matter. And then, yet in the meantime, we have the choice of whether or not we're going to let them disrupt unity within the church of Christ. So what then is the foundation of this unity that David is speaking of? And how can we strive to obtain it? I believe we've already touched on it a couple of times. If we look back to the passage from Galatians 3, which we read earlier, there's one little statement in verse 28 which says this, For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I believe that this is the one and only foundation upon which true, good, and pleasant unity within the church can be built. Jesus Christ Now, this doesn't mean that we won't or can't have disagreements, debates, or discussion about Scripture and our understanding of it. But those conversations need to start from the foundation of a few undebatable points. Firstly, that we serve a triune God who is Lord and creator of everything and who made us in His image to bring Him glory. Secondly, that that through the disobedience of Adam and Eve, sin entered the world, and thus, as it says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to come to the earth in human form, live a perfect sinless life, die on the cross in our place, and be raised again on the third day, all so that we might have a way to a right relationship with God. That is the foundation. From there, we can have honest discussion about personal beliefs or convictions, all while still dwelling in a state of unity. Take the building of a house, for example. First, the foundation is laid. That's what gives the entire building a solid footing to prevent it from shifting around over time. Now, from that point on, while there's general guidelines and safety rules that need to be met or followed, there can be some variance of the differences in the general construction of that building. Some would use two-by-sixes for studs in their walls, while some would beef it up and go with a two-by-eight. Now, still others might get really creative and do a double wall and go two by six and two by fours. Maybe they'd even use steel framing. Then you get to choose what type of flooring you're going to use, as Jake Braun would know well. Whether carpet, linoleum, hardwood, tile, maybe even just good old redneck plywood. See, we could go on and on, but I hope you're getting the picture that I'm trying to paint. We can have varying opinions or personal convictions and still dwell in a state of unity when our faith is built on and our attention focused on the person and work of Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozer wrote this in one of his books. He said, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So, 100 worshipers met together, each one looking away to Christ, or in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. Over and over through the New Testament, we are given and reminded of this command. John 15, 12. 
This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. Above all else, love. When our faith is built on the gospel, the door then is open wide through which we can love one another in spite of our differences. See, my friend can feel convicted to not drink alcohol at all. Well, I might not have a problem with having a drink here or there. And we can sit down and we can have a discussion about our convictions and understanding of the Scripture around the topic. And yet, yet at the end of the day, we can still go our separate ways and love each other because of, of what Christ has done for us. Disagreement and differences on non-salvation issues far too often lead to division, but they don't have to. And if we truly believe the gospel in its entirety, then they shouldn't divide at all. See, a faith or church built on opinions, personal convictions, or anything apart from the, from the finished work of Christ will ultimately lead to division and failure. Now, we'd be fools to think that this is an issue that only has an effect within the church. Because when the church lacks unity, the world notices. If we are so busy bickering and fighting about opinions and issues that have zero effect on our salvation, how are we then supposed to effectively reach out with the gospel? And why would they want any part of it? Before he ascended, Jesus left his disciples with this charge in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. This is the goal. Yes, it's important to seek to understand what the Scripture has to say about certain issues. But at the same time, we need a certain level of grace to understand that until we stand before the throne of God, there are many things that we just won't fully understand. And quite, quite, sorry, and quite frankly, when that day comes, I don't think we're really going to be concerned about whether we are baptized in a tank with a squirt gun or the simple flick of a finger. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves the question, is it really worth it to be right at the cost of creating division within the church and the hindrance of the gospel? With all that said, where are we left? David suggests in our passage this morning that how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity together. And that it's something that is blessed by God. But how do we strive for that? I want to reiterate what I believe are the two main points of application that we touched on this morning. Firstly is the command that Jesus gave to love. 1 John 3.23 says, And this is His commandment that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Again, this doesn't mean that we can't have differences of opinion. But at the end of the day, we're commanded to love each other. Now, I doubt that my wife and I are the only ones that have disagreements. And if you think that you've never had a disagreement with your spouse, you might want to have a conversation about that one. But just because my wife thinks, well, hey, we need 10 more goats and a milk cow and a couple pigs to keep life interesting. Meanwhile, I'm on the other side and I'll go, I don't want to wake up at 5 o'clock and milk the cow and go chase a loose pig around the community. It doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that we can't sit down and, and have a conversation about it. Even if we don't disagree, or sorry, if we don't agree on everything. But we can still walk away and we can still love each other. Despite our disagreements. 
Now, I know that may seem like kind of a silly example, but sometimes the things that we let create division within the church are just as petty. Now, I thought, well, I, I better see what all there is out there. So here's a few that I found, just for a laugh. The length of the worship pastor's beard. Whether or not the worship leader needs to wear shoes on a Sunday morning. Cran grape versus grape juice at the communion. What type of coffee to buy. Who has the authority to buy letter stamps for the church? Or whether fake plants should be allowed on the stage. It's goofy, is it not? And yet it creates division. This then leads to the second point of application. And that's what, our, what is our goal and our calling as believers? It says go and make disciples. Now over the next few weeks, Pastor Andrew is going to be going over our mission and vision as a church. And one of the main parts of our mission statement is that we exist to glorify God and make, believer, or, and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, can you imagine if every single believer put as much time and effort into sharing the gospel as we put into attempting to be right? See, we'll gladly waste hours in pointless arguments on social media. And yet, when it comes to serving in our church or sharing our faith with those that we come into contact with in our day-to-day -day lives, we somehow don't have enough time in our schedule. I want to challenge us all here this morning with the idea that it should be the exact opposite. That our focus should not be on being right about everything, but rather with the gospel as our foundation to be focused on sacrificially loving each other and then going out and making disciples. When that focus shift takes place, I believe that we too will find how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity and experience the blessing from God that it brings. I want to close with a challenge from Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Again, this is Paul speaking. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of you, sorry, to each, of, each one of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? but that he has also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, 
joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you sent your son to die for us on a cross. Father, far too often we, we let our own sinful pride get in the way of the gospel. Lord, we, we fill our days bickering and fighting, striving to be right instead of taking that same time and reaching out to the people that you put in our paths every day. God, I, I pray that you would open our eyes, that you would change our hearts and our focus away from um, that desire to be right and that we would be focused on you. Father, that when we would all be tuned to your heart, Father, that you would bring unity within the church. I thank you for each one here. God, I just pray that you would be with us all as we go into our weeks. That we would take the message and the challenge this morning, Lord, and apply it to our lives. I thank you for this. In your name I pray. Amen.